Well, hello everybody. Welcome to chapter six. We're getting into the skeletal system. In chapter six, we're going to talk about what bone is, what bone is composed of, how bone is formed, and the driving forces that help to maintain healthy bone. And of course, we'll talk about some disorders associated with our bones as well. So the skeletal system is actually covered in chapter six through nine. So that's four different chapters, but the majority of the material that will be on your lecture exam will come from chapters six and nine. Chapters seven and eight cover the bones of the body, which is what we will be focusing on in the lab portion. So your next um, quizzes will be most likely over bones. And then we'll get into that first lab practical, which covers everything from the first quiz all the way through the bones, okay? So this is just a figure showing um, bones that have been fossilized. Since bones are, are hard tissues, they are actually very, very solid. Um, they make great fossils, whereas soft tissues can um, be kept in special material. Uh, bones can just be preserved as they are. So it's really nice. Um, this is why we can see a lot of you know, like skeletal systems or skeletons from different organisms you know, that were hundreds of thousands and even millions of years old. Bone is living. It is not, um, well, non-living, but it contains both living and non-living material. It is a connective tissue. Um, the living cells are called osteocytes. Um, they're formed from stem cells known as osteoprogenitor cells. And then the non-living material, the extracellular matrix, is mainly composed of collagen fibers. Um, that are the proteins in the bone. And then we have inorganic materials, calcium and phosphate that settle into the collagen fibers, making the bone very, very strong. So bone has lots of functions. Um, of course, we have support, support um, of the entire body. Without the bones, we would not be able to hold our body up as we are able to. Um, we'd basically be a pile of tissue with muscle that would move us. So we'd kind of look like a, a blob or an amoeba with a mouth that could kind of talk maybe. So it'd be kind of weird looking. Um, so it gives us that structure and it supports our um, body weight. Bone helps us in movement. So bone itself does not provide movement. Muscles provide movement, but bones provide attachment sites to our skeletal muscle, which we can use voluntarily to move materials. And so that's what's going on here. This is well, a weightlifter moving his muscles and lifting weights. Bone is protective. It protects underlying tissues, the softer tissues. So think of that thoracic cavity or what you see here, this cranial cavity, which is protecting the brain. The thoracic cavity protects the lungs and the heart, those soft tissues that don't have protection otherwise. Um, it's that cranial cavity, that bone, or the ribs and sternum that um, protect the thoracic region and the underlying organs. Hematopoiesis. So hematopoiesis is blood cell production. All blood is, is made in bone. It's made in the red bone marrow. We have hematocytes, which are, or hemopoietic stem cells, um, that are going to differentiate into one of a plethora of different blood cell types. And this occurs in red bone marrow and we're constantly producing new blood all the time. And then we have storage. So bone also provides a storage place for fat, 
think of that yellow bone marrow in that um, middle or medullary cavity, and ions like calcium and phosphate, two of the most common ions in bone. Bone can be classified in different ways depending on the type of bone. In general, we're looking at the shape of the bone to determine what classification they fall under. We have long bones, so this is considered a long bone. It is longer in length than it is in width. We have short bones. Short bones are cube-like shapes. So they're, they have similar length and widths. We have flat bones, and so um, they're very, very flattened, and they typically have a curved shape. So here's that sternum, that is that flat bone, that's an example. And then we have irregular bones. Irregular bones are bones that have a unique shape, and so um, the vertebrae are considered irregular bones. There's also a fifth classification. And this is called a sesamoid bone. A sesamoid bone is a bone that forms in lines of stress. So in ligaments where we have lots and lots of stress. Um, the human body is composed of 206 bones in general. But, and so this is an adult, I should say. But um, all people can potentially have different numbers of bones. And the reason for this is because we form bones where we have areas of extra stress. So sesamoid bones are formed in areas where you have a lot of stress. Um, so if you have a job in which you are using your hands a lot, um, moving things, or maybe typing a lot or sewing, you can form extra bones in those ligaments. And so those individuals would actually have more bones than other individuals. There is an example, so everybody has, in general again, because there's always gonna be that exception, but there's an example of a sesamoid bone that everybody does have, and that is the, the patella. So we are not born with our patella. We form patella as we get, um, or as we move our legs in that ligament, in the patellar ligament. This is a classification um, table from your book that just talks about the different types of bones the features of those bones, um, the major functions of those bones, um, as well as examples. So the majority of the bones in our body that we talk about, um, long bones are the most common bones of the body. All of our phalanges are long bones, and we have a lot of phalanges. So. That's why they are the most common bone. Short bones um, make up your tarsals and carpals, so your wrist and ankle is composed of short bones. Flat bones, you have your cranial cap, your ribs, your sternum. Irregular bones, there's a lot of irregular bones, um, not near as many as there are you know, appendage bones or long bones, but irregular bones are just those unique shaped bones. A lot of your facial bones, your vertebrae are irregular bones. And then we have sesamoid bones, and these are going to be, um, the, the number of sesamoid bones is going to vary from individual to individual, depending on the amount of stress they have in specific regions of the body. But the example that is common to pretty much everyone is the patella. So let's look at the long bone and we'll um, identify the different structures associated with. So all long bones have a very common structure. This is a diagram of a femur. Femur has a longer length than it does width, so it's considered a long bone. The length of the long bone is called the diaphysis. The um, middle of the diaphysis 
is a cavity known as the medullary cavity or the marrow cavity. In adults, the marrow cavity or medullary cavity contains yellow bone marrow. In infants and young children, it's going to contain red bone marrow. This bone marrow can change, so it can be converted back to red bone marrow if um, our body needs to produce more blood for, because of illness or something. At the ends of our long bones, we have the epiphysis, so we have two epiphyses per long bone. We have a proximal epiphysis that is closer to the point of attachment, and then we have the distal epiphysis. The region that connects the epiphyses to the diaphysis is called the metaphysis. The metaphysis is a region that contains the epiphyseal plate. Epiphyseal plate is the cartilaginous um, hyaline cartilage plate that allows us to grow in length. So we actually gain length or size um, due to the growth of those plates. And when we reach our adult height, those plates will actually close up becoming epiphyseal lines, which is what you see up here. So the diaphysis is composed predominantly of um, compact bone, which is made of osteons, while the epiphyses are spongy bone made up of the trabeculae. Um, and then there's spongy, or within the spongy bone, we have red bone marrow, which is what that red coloration is. On the outside or surrounding our bone, we have a periosteum. A periosteum is a dense, irregular connective tissue layer that is held by little tiny perforating fibers into the bone. The periosteum has a fibrous layer and a cellular layer. The cellular layer contains um, your osteoprogenitor cells, which are the, the um, bone building cells. So these are the um, stem cells of bone. They contain osteocytes and sometimes osteoblasts and clasts as well. In the medullary region, we have an endosteum. The endosteum is going to be a layer of cells, um, osteoblasts, as well as um, osteoprogenitor cells. And then we have those osteoclasts that are going to break bone down. So osteoclasts are your bone breaking cells. Well, osteoprogenitor cells produce new osteoblasts. Osteoblasts produce osteoid or the bony matrix. Osteoclasts break down bony matrix. Flat bone then is composed of two thin layers of compact bone with spongy bone found in between. The spongy bone typically will contain red bone marrow again, um, depending on the age of the individual. I will say that. And irregular bones, I, so let me go back really quick. Irregular bones, short bones, and um, sesamoid bones are composed of a thin layer of the compact bone just like this with the spongy bone in between. So I, I say flat but this is also short, irregular, and sesamoid. So let's look at the actual cells that make up bone. We have osteoprogenitor cells which are the bone building cells which are here. These are stem cells that produce osteoblasts. Osteoblasts then are the baby bone cells that produce bony matrix. Once they are surrounded by the bony matrix, they become osteocytes. Osteocytes maintain the bony matrix and they have these, these long projections that reach out and touch other osteocytes. So they're all in contact with each other within the bone. 
and then we have osteoclasts that break bone down. Bone matrix is the um, non-living material that surrounds our bone. And there is both organic and inorganic material to bony matrix. So the organic material, which is produced by osteoblasts, is known as osteoid, and it is composed of collagen fibers, as well as glycoproteins and proteoglycans. The glycoproteins and proteoglycans hold everything together. The collagen fibers give the bone its tensile strength. So the bone is able to bend slightly without snapping. Inorganic material then, the non-living inorganic material that is part of that bony matrix is calcium and phosphate predominantly. Um, calcium and phosphate come together and they form hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite then settles in to the collagen fibers, making the bone much harder. So this hardens that bony matrix, and we end up having bones that are very, very hard, but still able to give a little under extreme pressure. And at that point, or at this point, I usually mention, have you ever had a child jump on your shin? And you're like, oh my God, that hurt, but it didn't break because your bone is very hard, yet slightly flexible. So there are two types of bone, and I've already talked about both types of bone, and we've talked about them also in chapter four. Um, most of the bone in our body is composed of compact bone or is called compact bone. Compact bone is composed of or forms osteons. So this is an osteon, this entire structure. And down here you can see an osteon. Um, when you were looking at the bone tissue in our tissue lab, the osteon kind of resembles a tree trunk that has been cut and so you're looking down and you see the rings of the tree that tell you the tree's age. Um, that's kind of what an osteon looks like. It has little rings around it. Those rims, those rings are called concentric lamellae. And within those rings we have tiny little um, like shallow depressions, and those depressions are called lacuna, and it's within those lacuna that we have each osteocyte. Spongy bone, on the other hand, does not have osteons at all. It does have osteocytes that maintain the bony matrix, but the bone that is formed is more of a lattice work. So it forms these structures called spicules and structures called trabeculae that um, make a like kind of that lattice that you see on like a, an apple pie. It's kind of that structure. And then in the holes of spongy bone, we have red bone marrow. So spongy bone only makes up about 20% of all of our bone mass, but spongy bone is really important because it lightens our weight so we can actually move around. Um, if our bone was completely solid, we wouldn't be able to move our body near as effectively. Um, if our skull was completely solid, we wouldn't be able to hold our head up. And spongy bone grows in lines where we have a lot of stress. So it actually provides protection from um, weight-bearing stressors. And so what this is showing is, and you can click on it to find the, the page that I found on the internet. Um, I like this picture because it shows what spongy bone looks like. So here you can see this is the femur. This is a um, section, so you have the femur cut in a um, a coronal section, so you can see um, one half of the femur, you can see the inside of the femur, 
and this is the epiphysis of the femur. There's the head. This is the greater trochanter. And here you see lines. These lines are where we have more stress. And as we move in, bone becomes more prominent. The spongy bone becomes thicker in those, that region because there's more stressors. In this area here, there's less stress. And so in the areas where there's less stress, we don't produce as much bone. And that's important. If you don't need bone, you don't have to produce more bone. Oops, sorry. There we go. Last thing on this video that I'll talk about is the blood and nerve supply. Bone is highly vascular, so it has a really good blood supply. It also has a nerve supply. If you've ever broken a bone, you know it has a great nerve supply because you feel pain. If you've ever chipped a bone, you feel pain. If you've ever had shin splints, you feel pain. That pain comes from the nerve supply. Bone is also highly vascular. If you've ever broken a bone, you, your leg or your arm, wherever you broke, swells up. That swelling comes from the increase of fluid from that broken blood vessel. So blood will pool at the area. Um, you'll also have the entire um, blood clotting event in that area. But at the beginning, as soon as it breaks, you're going to have a lot of blood pooling at that area to uh, provide protection to that environment. Uh, the, where the broken bone is. Um, because bone is highly vascular, it is able to heal a lot more effectively than other tissues. So bone will heal um, if given time. So I'm going to stop here and we'll talk about bone formation in our next video, okay? Do 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 do